This is Thunder and Lightning here on Super Talk Mississippi. Brian Hayden and Robbie Falk here with you on a Friday morning. I know it's not actually Friday, y'all. I know, I know. Just play along. Just, just, just let's all pretend that it's Friday just here for a minute. Uh, we are live here at the Little Dewey, the first stop on the Thunder and Lightning Summer Catfish Tour. We have been eating fried catfish. I, I'm, I'm full of fried I can't eat anything else. So, But we've also got some great interviews today that we're going to get to. Uh, we've talked to Zach Selman, Mississippi State Athletic Director, really good conversation. He's had a busy couple of weeks uh, these past week. We talked to Brent Johnson, who is the uh, sales manager at Superior Catfish. He, he has, I think he has a bigger title than that. He just don't want to tell us what it is. He's very low-key. He, he's too low-key. I mean, the man runs the best catfish company here in the state of Mississippi. And a voice that'll put you at ease. Let me just tell you something about this man's voice. When you hear it, it's like melted butter. Like just, just, just like syrup over pancakes. <laughs> just... It's a beautiful thing. So great to talk to him and our friends at Superior Catfish who are sponsoring our, our catfish tour. Uh, and then we're going to talk uh, to Bart Wood, who owns this fine establishment, the Little Dewey, the one who's maybe the most famous restaurant in all of Starkville, uh, and something known around the Southeastern Conference. So, But we're going to dive right in with Zach Selman. We're going to get right to that interview, and we'll just sort of run them back to back to back for you guys here. Uh, to talk to him just a few minutes ago. About some good stuff, and got, got his thoughts on a, a number of topics, including the Egg Bowl. Wanted to hear if you want to hear what the uh, the new top dog has. He has a great story about the Egg Bowl trophy. So we're gonna get right into that, and then when we come back, right before Robbie and I come back, you might hear a song if you know what we're saying. So here we are, joined by the man of the hour, Mississippi State Athletic Director Zach Selman. You've been a busy man these past couple weeks. You know, you, you think being the athletic director, it's the off season. Just put your feet up on the desk and let things happen. But no, you you will start in Destin, not just the time on the beach down there. This was a, a really crucial set of meetings down there uh, as they sort of set the tone for what the SEC schedule is going to look like with the arrival of Oklahoma and Texas. Eight game schedule. I think that's the I think that's best for Mississippi State. I think you agree with that. Is it best for the SEC right now? Yeah, I think it is. And one. It's good to be on with both of you. Yeah, oh, we ate all your catfish. Yeah. I apologize for that. That was all him. <laughs> that's probably good. I've been eating my way through Starkville, Mississippi the yeah, last couple of months. Uh, Destin was great. It was a lot of meetings. You know, I think that's the misconception of uh, we were hanging out at the beach, all of that. <laughs> I think I saw the beach the very last day. Our youngest daughter decided she was going to go parasailing. <laughs> so I had to go see that from yeah. a distance. Uh, but meetings were good. Started on a let's see, a Tuesday morning, talked a lot of things, started off about just what's the construct of the NCAA, what's the construct of college sports, uh, what do we want to do, what do we want to be in the SEC. So that took a lot of uh, time, a lot of consideration. Clearly, it's a challenging time in college athletics. We want to make sure that the SEC remains the top conference in America and tired of getting changed from people outside of our business. So as leaders in, in on the nation or on the national scale, how can we – um, develop some things and make sure that we push things to the forefront. So we spent a lot of time on that and didn't spend as much time um, the first day on scheduling. Um, spent, again, we wanted to make sure scheduling is an important part of it, eight or nine games, but the most important part is, like, how do we forge the future of college athletics? Um, so, uh, I, you know, clearly that was my first time in the Destin meetings but from my counterpart to my peers. Uh, a lot of it was these were kind of the healthiest, meatiest conversations we've had. And then by, by the time we evaluated the eight or nine game schedules, clearly you want to make sure that you have a pathway uh, to the postseason. You want to be have an opportunity to, for me, I always look at it, how can we have the opportunity to get to the college football playoff um, and decided, you know, yeah, in favor of, the, uh, of an eight game schedule right now, um, but we'll still continue to evaluate what a nine game schedule will look like. Uh, there, but not just that, what's scheduling look like going forward? You know, clearly the Big Ten's done some different things with their scheduling model. Um, the NFL's changed some of their scheduling model recently. So I, I would suspect we're always looking critically at what's the best model. And I know those conversations won't just stop last week, but they'll be ongoing. Did the SEC give any guidance about the potential for buyout games? Because if they, they do go to nine games, there's going to have to – Mississippi State has four games, I think, through 2029. 20, Did they give some guidance of, okay, this is how we're going to do this? I know Arkansas – revealed that they have contract language that lets them out if the conference goes to nine games. Is that a similar situation here? Yeah, it wasn't necessarily guidance from the SEC. I think in all of our game agreements, that's something we look at. You know, none of us expected COVID to do what COVID did. Uh, and that's not just an athletics thing. I think that's a societal thing. Uh, when you go through that, you look at the agreements that we had for that year. 
and how do you get out of that and how do you adjust to that so i think uh from the from the standpoint of always remaining flexible knowing that you you try to uh predict the future as much as possible but you can't and so as we looked at our future scheduling that's one of the things that we've looked at as all of our games um see if get, have scenario planning you know it gets tiresome the scenario playing your schedule because it's like playing tetris um but that's what we've done and that's what we'll continue to do you touched on it briefly the the path to the college football playoff and for mississippi state getting a top four ranking is is going to be really difficult they they almost got there in 2014 but when it expands out the chances of getting the college football playoff grow tremendously i mean how much has that changed the game for places like Mississippi State and, and other schools around the SEC? Oh, I mean, it changes the game totally. Um, it makes you rethink how, how you schedule the non-conference season. Um, from us, the infrastructure, too. You know, as we're looking at our facility projects and um, how we do our business, it's not just for – and we love our fans for non-conference and home games. But I'm excited to see when uh, the expanded CFP happens and we've got a game coming here. Can you imagine Little Do It? Can you imagine Thunder and Lightning <laughs> when a CFP game is about to go? It's yeah. going to be bananas. Uh, yeah. So that's that's how we're looking at it. I think it's going to be great for college football. I think it's going to be great for our student athletes. It's going to be great for uh, the future of the game, for youth participation. There's something special about college football. And I can't wait till we get to show the world how special Starkville, Mississippi is when we get to host a game here. You mentioned something whenever you're talking about that, the facilities, upgrades, and things like that. In the current landscape that you have here in college athletics where you have NIL popping up and that's become a huge part of things, how do you weigh out the importance of the uh, the up facility upgrades, Bulldog Club, things like that, and also trying to provide a, a good atmosphere for NIL too? Yeah, it's a balance. Um, no different, I think, as you look at how you invest your resources, that's how it is. We want to make sure that we, you know, we've got to be competitive in the NIL space. Uh, we've been very fortunate, you know, people that have came before me here, our facilities are in really good shape as far as the bones of them. So now it's going to come in with some of the aesthetics, modernizing some of the things we do with re sports recovery. So that's going to be a big um, uh, kind of priority for us. But I think every year it's something we're going to sit back and not just you know, roll budgets over to just because that's what we've always done, but it's going to be uh, we're going to invest in what matters the most. And so for right now, it's going to be uh, we're really working on NIL being bold there. Uh, but also we've got plans to do a master plan that's about to underway or go underway uh, so we can look at not only where we're at, but how we can stair step over time to make sure um, all of our sports facilities. I'm not just football. You know, I understand the economics of football, uh, but want to make sure that we have the best facilities, the best resources, the best programming uh, for all of our student athletes. And as we're doing that, uh, we're not just thinking about, you know, for our teams, we're also looking at if, okay, if we have to shift, shift to a, a different model, how can we use our facilities and make sure that we continue to generate new revenues, how we can make sure that we have a great experience for not only our student athletes, but our fans, stakeholders, our, our uh, general campus community. So a lot of fun stuff. A lot of, a lot, if there's a word, it's being flexible. I think that's it. And, and some VIP seating for the media, too, I think, is in the master plan, isn't it? Yeah. So we, we got some VIP seating. <laughs> it's, on the record. Um, it's on the record. And then we've got some seating for you, too. Oh. We're, we're going <laughs> to move, move further up the seats at the hub. Oh, yeah. It's be like Bob Uecker, but I'm oh, be in the front row. <laughs> yeah, I hope you guys got good tennis shoes because the nosebleeds are going to be great yeah, for you. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, Sounds great. Sounds great. So that segues into you were in Washington, D.C. yesterday with a, a, a contingent from the SEC with you, Dr. Keenum, uh, Zach Arnett, Sam Purcell, and the NIL is, is the topic of discussion. I'm going to be a little honest with you start off here. We're going to trust the government to fix things. <laughs> no comment. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that was the correct comment. <clears throat> what were those conversations like up there in Washington yesterday? Yeah, there were, there were great conversations. And, uh, you know, I think I've, I've said it many times, we've got the best college president in America. And you, you go up there with Dr. Keenum, and clearly he's had a, a great history in yeah, Washington, D.C. Yeah. So I think that's helpful. Because when it's like with uh, Zach and Sam and I, it's like oh, three stooges going up there. <laughs> but we had a we had a, a great um, uh, let's see meeting two nights ago, and we, we spent most of the day. We actually ended up uh, till about 1 a.m. at the Capitol two nights ago, or I guess two mornings ago, and then yesterday that we were there most of the day and had a great meeting with our uh, the delegation from the state of Mississippi. Uh, we also met with uh, Ole Miss at kind of a joint meeting. And then we had a, just to talk about, okay, we've got to do what's best for the state of Mississippi. And I thought that was very um, 
positive dialogue with, with our uh, legislature, um, but really try to put more um, stories and more practicalities of what's actually going on in the world. And then we had a, another bigger joint session with all the SEC, which uh, a lot of good conversation. So now I think it's going to be how do, how do we uh, collectively act upon what we talked about. Yeah, when we think about Mississippi State and Ole Miss, not a lot of agreement, not a lot of common ground between those two institutions. But when you talk to Keith Carter, do you feel like from an NIL perspective, you guys are, are kind of on the same page? Yeah, because at, at the end of it, you know, clearly the rivalries are what makes college sports. And we want to beat uh, Ole Miss and everything. We want to beat everybody and everything. But we, we ultimately want to protect college athletics. We want to protect the student athlete experience and be okay with changing some of the things. So I think you, you, you take some of that those hats off and it's like if, if we don't fix this um somebody else some in some legal courtroom in a different part of the country is going to try to fix something for us and we don't want that to happen so i think we we all love college athletics too much to let that happen i want to know what that plane ride was like with that group of people yeah you have dr keenum very stoic and then you have you other three guys well there's a couple other people on there with us uh it was good you know I think anytime you're around Dr. Keenum, it's just uh, hearing more about the vision, more about yeah. you know how to prep for for some of those meetings. So it was, it was a great plane ride. Had some good food. We didn't have little Dewey's catfish. Although if we <laughs> did, it put us put us all in a sleek coma. Uh, but it, it was really fun. And I think yesterday we were all struggling a little bit because we were up so late the night before. But it it was really cool. What they uh, showed us behind the scenes of so many of the inner workings of it, which I had never experience and actually coach Arnett and I were talking this morning at camp of didn't know all the tunnels and uh, yeah. the train rides that we went on mm -hmm. under, underneath the Capitol building um it was it was really cool if we had, would have had a tent we probably would have slept there but it, it shows the history too of uh you know to see where Abraham Lincoln's desk is and being the, the speaker of the house's chamber all of that was was really cool it feels like off season's a word that doesn't really exist anymore in athletics you know it, there's never really an off season there's always something going on what is a summer checklist like for an athletic director? What, what are you looking at? Say, okay, June 30th, this needs to be done. July 31st, this needs to be done. What, what does the summer look like for you? Yeah, it's kind of a, a rolling calendar. When I first started in this business, you know, late July, early August, you got some downtime. But now there's always something. Uh, so we've got kind of an annual calendar that we go off of and make sure that we have these checks and so whether it's you know what are we gonna do for next away game or next year's away football games just little things like that to make sure that we um, constantly are updating there's not a a true break but I think that's one of the things that's really cool there's never a, a day that's like yesterday too yeah I met with our incoming freshmen student athletes this morning a lot of our football and women's basketball and basketball guys and it was really cool just to see how young people are when they come in here and they were uh, some of them were trying to stay awake. I think I was that boring to them, uh, but it shows just the future. And 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 I, that's what I love. I'll be able to see them next year, and then as they graduate, to see their maturation and growth. There's not a there's not a day that goes by that's the same. Uh, but I think if, if we look at kind of the annual calendar, we always have different checkpoints that we do along the way. It's kind of strange for me to not see your family with you right now because I feel like every time I look up, there they are, right there with you. How important is that for you to have your family part of this whole process, part of this whole adventure with you, um, and having them kind of experience some of these things that they've been able to experience so far? Yeah, no, it's uh, critically important. You know, my wife's the MVP of everything. I've got an easy job. What she has to do to keep up with our two little girls is the hard job. Uh, you know, I've worked with some great people and for some great people, and I've always just believed that you've got to integrate your work, your life. I mean, if not, uh, there's too much time demands. So our oldest daughter, Shane, is 12. Um, she's been in basketball camp this week. But she come, uh, actually, a funny story. So she came home our camp a couple weeks ago. She came home, and she's like, I got a new nickname. And I'm like, okay, what is it? She's like, it's McBuckets. And I was like, McBuckets? <laughs> she's like, yeah, I won one-on-one -on -one at camp, so now I'm McBuckets. So uh, I've, I've taken Shane with me probably the last, uh, let's see, eight years to, to football games go early walk through and she's very critical of whether it's how our facilities look how concessions is marketing really good um so i've really enjoyed just listening to her and she's really big in the in the sports data she's got a couple friends in this league that uh their dad's coach and so they they talk a lot about rpi and the first time i heard her talk to her friend on the phone about uh strength of scheduling what are you doing <laughs> uh so it's really cool to have her and then our, our youngest meatballs are just kind of coming of age where 
she's interested in it. Um, she likes, she's more of likes the spirit and likes the, the marketing elements of it. But it's, again, it's critically important in our business, not just for my family, but all of our staff's family. You know, our staff does such a good job and our coaches, you know, there's no down season for our coaches and the support staff. So we want to make sure that whether you um, have a family or maybe it's just you have a dog, everybody's welcome and know that, you know, no one person, no one family can do things alone. Um, so that's kind of the culture. And I think that's a culture of Mississippi. It's a, it's a family affair. It's connection. It's how can we come together and do some really good things. I envy that a little bit. I can't even get my daughter to sit down and watch one inning of baseball. Yeah. My daughter, she's an album, so man, never. Well, I, I got to do like uh, wear some earplugs because Meatball, our youngest, she likes to do the cowbell in your ear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it'll wake you up. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's probably where she gets her nickname yeah. from, things yeah. like that, huh? We did yesterday's podcast entirely on the egg fall. We, we were 12 weeks away from the start of the season. We like to go back to front with the schedule. You've been around the state talking to Mississippi State fans. I know that topic comes up. You know, you've got a long way till Thanksgiving night, but when you talk to Mississippi State fans about that game, what, what are they saying to you? Oh, just a sense of pride. And a sense of pride for their school, a sense of pride for the state. Um, I think you comes with a great time, too, on Thanksgiving. So you, you're around your family, your loved ones, your friends, uh, and then to be able to go watch one of the most iconic rivalries in college sports. I think that's something I'm really excited about. You know, I've I uh, haven't experienced a, a home game at Davis Wade, and I'm just so thrilled and excited to see that. I've, at Wake, we played at Oxford, so we have played there and, and won, shall I say. Uh, but it shows, you know, we were in Jackson probably a month or two ago and went to dinner, and it, it sounds silly, but we had the Egg Bowl trophy with us. We were doing yeah. an event before, so uh, one of the guys was like, hey, you can't leave in the car, so Coach Arnett actually brought it in with us to dinner so nobody would take it. Yeah. And then you walk through the restaurant and people are like, I just saw how much that meant to people. Yeah. Like it was almost like you're walking through with just like, I don't know, a million bucks. People just wanted to see it so much. And I think all of the, the, the time I've been here, you see the sense of importance of that game. Again, the players, the great players from state, you know, I just met with uh, one of our former defensive ends. Uh, his nickname was the sack master. And he, his, he's uh, here in town for a couple of days. It's, and that's what he talked about, talked about playing in the Egg Bowl, talked about the teammates. So I think that's something that um, is critically important and one of the things I know uh, we're excited about this Thanksgiving night. We're here. This is our first stop on our catfish tour. We're going to be traveling around the state trying catfish. Is catfish big in Oklahoma? Yeah, it is. You know, a lot of people noodle. I've never I've done that. that yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, now, I said you going to take I, you some. I saw your, your, the look on your face. Oh, oh you, you got to look. I got to look at how your done. hands look. Yeah. The, oh, yeah. No, I've done it. I've done it before. Yeah. I don't want to do it again. I just, I just, I just like to show up here and it's already fried, and I, I go, I just take it <laughs> well, from there. We'll go noodling, and then we can bring what we catch here, and we'll fry it up. Oh goodness, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> I don't know about all that. I guess we'll see you again at SEC Media Days. Yep, we'll Zach be there, Solomon, Mississippi State Athletic Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate you, sir. And so the, the whole, you know pinnacle point of our tour here is that we are sponsored by our good friends at Superior Catfish. This is Brent Johnson. He is the head catfish. That's what he told me his official title was. King he's Catfish. The, he's the big fish in the big pond. I don't think you guys missed something. <laughs> no, nah, something lost <laughs> in translation there? Yeah, yeah, the little fish. Here's what I'm going to say. This, this is a question you probably get a lot. The, the company's name is Superior Catfish. That is you, right. You set yourself up for you know, is it superior catfish? So that, what makes superior catfish superior? Because of superior. You know, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of the show. Thank you. They so pay him the big bucks for drop a that line. Just drop it right there. <laughs> Throw it on the floor. <laughs> and now, you know what? You've heard the saying, the devil's in the details. Yeah. And I truly believe that is ultimately at the end of the day what makes superior better. Um, but there's a lot, of, lot more that goes into it than just that. Um, we are a medium small size plant but we're owned by farmers and every one of those farmers i would say they know their farms and ponds intimately they go out and feed personally they manage them and it all starts with the pond, uh, out of the uh, pond side the farm they care about what they're doing they come to the plant they buy fish take it home feed it to their families and if you ever had a piece of fish that tastes like mud 
I don't know if there's not much else that's worse than that. One of the worst things you can have is, is yeah. a bad piece of fried catfish. Th that's one of the things that I was that I that's really kind of sold me on Superior is when I taste a piece of Superior catfish, I know I'm getting the same piece every time. I'm not going to get a slimy piece. I'm not going to get a muddy piece. H how do y'all how do y'all configure that? I mean, how does that happen? How do you get that kind of catfish 100% of the time? I would say it comes down to the personnel there at the plant. They take it. They take their job serious. They get personal, and you know, basically everybody's on a first name basis there. They know each other, and we know what it takes to make. Like we said, I don't. I don't. I'm not going to buy fish and take it home. And if it tastes bad, that's the worst thing for me. Mm -hmm. And I think those people that work there, they know that. And it's all about consistency. You talk about the details. It starts from the cleanliness of the plant. When our cleanup crew at night cleans, I think it's as clean a plant out there. I mean, you, you come in, you look at it, there really doesn't have any smell. I was in there the other night after hours, and it didn't smell like a processing plant. We were in there, and, yeah. and we, were, we were marked on that. We were like, you don't feel like it, because you have that worry, right? When you tell somebody, hey, we're going to tour a catfish plant, you're like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> and I'm ready. And then you go in there, and it's like. But you didn't wear shorts, though. I know I was smart enough to wear pants in a minus ten degree room. I had no I had no idea we were gonna go into a minus ten degree freezer <laughs> and I was gonna look like a you know, a sweet little old lady whenever we whenever we walked in there. I mean it was it was cold. The the operation though there is just unbelievable. I mean, down to the little details. Yeah. You know, and then it comes to our sample room, I think the number one thing you talked on sliminess, that's over injection. People over inject, you leave it sit in water slush too long and it picks up that, but don't get frozen time. It, uh, it, it goes bad, gets flavor on it, gets slimy. And we strive to do everything the same every time, whether it's a sampling from the time they come in, we got a sample crew that's three people and our head QC lady, she's been with us 20 plus years. And I would say she's as good as anybody out there. She, if she says it's good, it's good. And if she says it's not, it's not. And if you, if you try to argue with her and you think you're going to bypass her, <laughs> it'll come back to bite you. I sat in that room for a period of time and I did it. I was in the sample room and I know you juggle the farmers. They got to keep their farms in business. They got to sell fish and you think, well, this, this one's good enough. And I would go against her and I would hear a complaint from our, from our uh, sales team. I wasn't in sales then. I was just buying, I was a fish buyer. And I could say, yeah, I know what happened. <laughs> you could just about trace it back the day that she said these fish were good. And I said, you know what? I'm going to take them. It would come back and bite me. Yeah. <laughs> the thing with Superior, too, is, you know, when we were there, is the people there seem very bought into everything you, you're telling us right now. It, it's not just a, uh, you know, a, a cliche or a slogan. The, it really is how everybody, from the people working the line to the people in the office, that's how they operate. Oh, without a doubt, you know. It starts from the farm side. We have 40 farmers that roughly that own the plant. We're a co-op, and it is there strictly to market their fish. So they know if they put a good product out in the market, it's going to only increase sales. People are going to come back for more, and that just that goes all the way through the plant. There's a number of us that work there that we that we farm fish too. I'm a fish farmer. I farm, I got ponds. I farm fish. So everybody there takes it very very personal, and I think that trickles all the way down through our employees. They they take their job serious. They know what good fish are. They take fish home to eat. And it's it's the same every time. And I, that's another thing I think that's huge with Superior's consistency. It's doing the same thing, holding the same criteria every single day. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I wanted to know about you personally, how do you get into this business? But when, when did you start saying, you know what, I'm gonna work in catfish? You know, I guess I could probably, how you, how'd you get started with, <laughs> doing podcasts, working with 247. It's what you grew up around. I grew up on the ro on a farm, row crop farm, uh, soybean and corn back in the 80s. And uh, that was when farming was really depressed. My dad, he ran old equipment. We thought we were going broke and losing the farm every year. And he got in the fish, and uh, that was kind of where the excitement was. That's what kind of drew me. He got started building a fish pond. That's what kind of saved his farm. And there was just opportunity to harvest fish for the farmers. And eventually I had my own harvesting crew for the plant. And uh, I was asked to take a spot in the, in the plants of the plant manager. And it just went from there. It's just, it's become a passion. 
I tell people, if you cut my, if you cut me, cut my veins open, it's going to bleed catfish. That's what it's going to be. <laughs> That's kind of an interesting visual. I'll just go ahead <laughs> and be totally honest with you. We got so yeah, it's a family business too. We, your brother's here, friend. We got Pam here. She's That's like right. family That's to you. Right. And you know, when I think about catfish, I think about family because you think about sitting around the table or having a big fish fry. My, my family, we had a fish fry every year with a, with all a sort of a family reunion. Well, it was in the 80s. You see, he's going to get in trouble now. Was it, you, were y'all around in the 80s? Well, it wasn't superior in the 80s. Well, it was. It, was, may, it may have been inferior, but there it, you it go. was still there good you to go. be it. There you uh, go. But, but that being said, for you, you know, how important is the family aspect of this business? Oh, it's huge. To me, that's what you get. When you buy superior, you know you're feeding a small Mississippi farm family. It's a small farm. Everyone's a small farm, and it's it's run by the family. The the dad, the sons, they're out there. They're feeding fish every day. They're taking care of the ponds. They're mowing the levees. That's everything. That's that's how it is. So if you buy Superior, you're really feeding the small family of America. That's that's really what at the crux of it is. That's that's really what it is. How does this plant end up in Macon, Mississippi? It, we, I, the reason I ask that is because you know you you think of a lot of these catfish places you're thinking the delta where where did making mississippi kind of come into play you know that's interesting and it's it's a little bit of a story and i'll try to make it quick but uh in the late 70s probably early 80s there was a gentleman there with his family he was he had moved in from out of out of state and he was trying to make a living with his family and he was trying to truck farm garden farm and if you know anything about garden in mississippi if you're going to use that black clay dirt over in our area that's work <laughs> no. real work yeah take a hold of that stuff and you'll find something you'll find out what it, what it's all about but uh he was having a tough time of it and he was some friends with some local farmers and people there in the area and they said well somehow they got the idea to build him some fish ponds so he built one or two really small like maybe an acre two acre farm in his around his house there and he fed them and when they were ready to harvest him and his sons family he had kind of a big family they went out and caught fish with a rod and reel themselves and they took it up there to the shop they dressed them by hand and they went to the local grocery store there in Macon back then with 5 10 15 pounds and say do you want catfish do you want to try these here and they said yeah we'll try them so they bought them and then next week he'd done the same thing again and that's it just took off from there he started hitting more and more small grocery stores restaurants, gas stations back back in the back roads. And it grew till it got bigger than what his family, he wanted it for his own family operation and he offered it to the farmers. They were using it to market their fish and they wanted to keep having a place because they built fish depending on, it was saw fish back then. That was a, the guy last, uh, the name of the family was saw fish. And he just said, I'll sell it to the farmers that have been selling it here. So the farmer said, yeah, we, we need a place to keep marketing our fish. and than what we're doing. So there was a group of farmers that went in and bought it and that's, and they named it Superior and that's how Superior came to be. Well, if you want to try Superior catfish and you're up here in the Golden Triangle, there's a lot of places you can go grab it. You can go to the Sunflower over there in Columbus or the Butcher Shop. You can go to Piggly Wiggly down in Louisville, Robbie's hometown. Yes, sir. Of, there you go. It's, and the Sunflower also in West Point, but I would say make it easy on yourself and just let them cook it for you here at the Little Dewey. That's what I would say. Come to Little Dewey's. So. I mean, my mouth's watering right now. I'm, I'm thinking about it. Ready to roll. Brent Johnson, sales manager for Superior Capitals. Thanks so much for joining us here. Thanks, Thanks guys. It's been, a, it's been an honor. Appreciate you, Brent. If you're from Starville, you know who this man is. He needs no introduction. Bart Wood, the owner. That's right. Little Dewey. Yeah, is second, this second most, generation. I'm just going to put you right on the spot. Is this the most iconic restaurant in Starville? Well, we've been here for 38 years. This is our 30-year anniversary, so we've been here a while, so I'll let you answer that question. That was a humble way of saying it. <laughs> Absolutely it is. So, Little Dewey, we, we know Little Dewey. People hear that name, especially around the SEC. You know, they know it from college game day, and they think barbecue. Right. And the barbecue's great, obviously, right. here at Little Dewey. But catfish, people ask me about Little Dewey all the time, and I say, look, barbecue's good. Go there and get your pulled pork sandwich. It's great. But that's the best catfish I've ever had. Well, the, the catfish almost caused a divorce between my mom and dad. <laughs> you know, I'm just gonna we, like, you, like you said, we, we started with barbecue back in, in 85. And after we bought the house that we're in now, which is the old little fire station house where the chief lived in, dad had the great idea of putting fryers in. And, um, you know, the, 
my mom just was doing nothing of that. And um, at that time, nobody in Star was doing catfish. Yeah. And if we weren't the first, I guarantee we were the second. So he had the idea of doing catfish, and it just took off. And we've been blessed to have some of the same ladies that were cooking then still with us today. If they're not cooking, they're teaching. And that's, that's very important. We were just talking to, to Brent Johnson about superior catfish and about the family atmosphere. That, that's also the, the case here at Little Dewey. I mean, you oh, yeah. mentioned you got people yeah. working for you for a yeah. long, long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm second generation. My son, Carter, he's coming aboard. He's going to be third generation. So 38 years, and we've had some folks in our form for 23, 25, 30 plus years. And that makes a difference because you need to have that consistency. In the food business, it's all about consistency. Well, do you think that's kind of been the secret for y'all? I mean, we, we talked about the, you know, the iconic nature of this place. When people come to town, they want to get a little dewy. What, what has set this place apart? What, what has been the difference for, for this place to keep it in this location and to be as big as it has been over the years? Well, I think consistency. I mean, you have to, you've got to hit that mark if you can be successful. Because if somebody's saying, hey, let's go to Little Dewey's and get catfish, you know, and then they come and it's not as good as it was the first time, well, they may give you one more try, but you, hit, you don't hit that mark the second time, in today's competition, they're going somewhere else. So yeah. we've got to be consistent. I preach it all the time to my folks. Well, and that kind of brings me to that point about Superior. I, I was just talking to Brent about it. The consistency is there with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, it's so, I mean, it kind of goes hand in hand with the people cooking it and all that. I mean, what what do you think has been the difference with Superior? What have you seen from from them that you really enjoy, you know, the, providing them? For me, it's the, it's, the, it's the consistency of the size of catfish I get from them in a the case. Every four to five ounce fillet we get is going to be a true four to five ounce fillet. That's a yep. must. I built this business on that, and also the taste, the clarity of their catfish is superior in the name to any other in the state of Mississippi, in my opinion. What's your secret for catfish? I know there's there's I know the, it's it's a great to start with a great product. You have to do that. Well, you, there, there's something else going on in the bread or something that you're not telling people. You got to put the skin side down when you fry it. So that's all it is. <laughs> so duly noted. Yeah, 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 for sure. On a busy weekend, how much catfish are you selling? When, when we're talking about Mississippi State playing LSU or Alabama, big crowd in town, SEC game weekend, twenty plus, thirty cases, something like that. Thirty cases, yeah. and that's the, that's the, that's the plays. The whole we do the whole fish, do the bone in fish. Yeah. That's still popular, and we do a good bit of it. On ball game weekends, we have to take that off the menu, though, because it just is a more dense fish, and it takes longer to cook. And on you know, those weekends, we're trying to go with the, you know, get them in and get them out, get them to the game stuff. And then, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, and I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you do catering, and mm -hmm. I love to bring a little do You want to show up, and you want to be the, the, the star of the tailgate. If you want to show up with a little dewy catfish tray. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. you, you just became everybody's That's favorite guy. We do a lot of catfish catering around the state, too. I've gone... I've gone to um, Bluxy, Mississippi, and, and done weddings with catfish before. I mean, we go statewide with catfish. So, they're back there fixing us some some lunch right now. They are. What, 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 what are we going to have? Because I was told, you know, we got some fried catfish, and that's I love that. But I was told there was something else happening. Well, I'm I'm going to introduce the sandwich this weekend. It's called a catfish Reuben. Uh, oh, now okay. It's a little different twist on the way a catfish fell, but We're going to actually take the sauerkraut. Mm -hmm. Put it on your bottom bread, mm -hmm. catfish that's fried, mm -hmm. and put the Thousand Island dressing on it. Oh. A couple of crispy strips of bacon. Oh. Compress it, grill it on both sides, and cut it and serve it. So that's kind of a brand new twist. Can we just food. can we just start recording this every single <laughs> yeah, every single day from here? Thunder and Lightning now live from Little Dewey every day. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah. Wow, it's crazy how that happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And not gonna cost you anything. Just yeah. a few sandwiches every That's day. right. It's it wouldn't make that happen, I promise you. I, lo I love this uh, this bar area too. You said when I was a kid, none of this, this obviously yeah. none of this stuff was here. But I, I loved coming to Little Dewey for the ambiance, and you know back then we had the you could color pictures and put them right. on the wall and all yeah. that. But I love how the expansion here. You got this bar area where we're in right now, and then the the back patio back here right. too. When did all that come into play? And I mean, how pleased are you with all this? Well, the back patio we'll start with it first is um, that's where we do a lot of events back there, whether it's crawfish catering for the sororities and fraternities, or we just have um, graduation parties or whatever back there. We used to see about 300 back there. Um, the bar here that we're in now, we're actually taking it this summer. We move it to the front of the house and return this back to the seating. So when you walk up, you'll see that we do have a bar and you can get your beverages that way. Interesting. Work. Okay. Um, as far as the the, um, the the drawings we used to put on the um, the walls and whatnot, well, it got to a point where sometimes as college kids do, they take a little liberty with things <laughs> yeah. that they say with crayons and write on the wall. 
and we just had to make the decision being a family restaurant that, that Robbie, some of those it was no longer the stick figure that, that robbie followed yeah, through it was you know, an extra stick or two in yeah places so exactly you know, just had to you i imagine that restaurant. i imagine that got a little out of control yeah, that's right that's so. right how long for little little do we been in business 38 years this year what are the next 38 look like for you well, we don't know. We just we just take one day at a time, tie a knot at the end of the rope, and hang on, and just hope for the best, and try to do our best. And um, you know, it's been a successful story from 38 years. We're thankful. One last question, and I know you know the answer. How much did your business change when Lee Corso said, "Little Dewey's my favorite <laughs> restaurant"? Well, I was, I was, Dad's here. He's outside my office now, but he he's not gonna come in and talk right now. But uh, back in those days, you now you're thinking pre 9 11, yeah. before security was like it, it is today. You know, Dad used to could take um, food up to the press box, mm -hmm. and he started doing it when Larry Templeton was um, AD out there. Got to know all those guys pretty good, and he got to the point where Lee would never come through the front door. He just comes through the back door and walk through the kitchen and say, hey, Barry, I need my catfish. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and we'd all say, that's Mr. Corsto. Just let him do his thing, you know? <laughs> and then, you know, those guys, when we started getting that, that national, you know, mention, you know, that was that a game changer. I yeah. think security is, is good enough. We can just go ahead and let you back up in the press box and bring us. Yes. You know, uh, hey, I can make that happen, yeah. We'll make it happen. We'll do it. Bart Wood, Little Dewey. Hey, thank you for having us. Thank you, it. sir. Man. We thank you for having us. Appreciate it. All right. Good job. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, Robbie. So Mississippi State continues the hot streak recruiting wise. Xavier Gayton, a they're going to list him as an athlete. I think he's yeah. listed as a running back, but Mississippi State recruiting him as a safety. I talked to Paul Jones uh, on Wednesday, Thunder and Lightning Live on Super Talk. Timely interview. I had a feeling. Unfortunately, when we tried to record the podcast yesterday, we were kind of waiting for that. Yeah, yeah. That recru that recruitment. Xavier to... Gate needs to get on the on the Fat Clark program. Yes. Which is, I'm going to let you guys know before we all record what's going on. Like I, two minutes before we. Record. I can't. I can't afford to wait around. I my, my time is very valuable, <laughs> as you know. Um, but now, talking to Paul, he said, "Good get with this kid, and not going to be the last." Let's start with Xavier Gaten. Came to the book, the big, the top dog camp this past week, and really had a good showing. Has picked up offers from State and Ole Miss in the last couple of weeks. Decides to make the call to be a bulldog. The momentum Mississippi State is building is really palpable at this point. Yeah, and a lot of it in state, but they, they I mean, they're making some moves with kids out of state as well. Um, it's just, it's one of those things we've been talking about like two weeks ago. State just needed to get the ball rolling a yeah. little bit. They just needed a couple of guys to jump in here and there just to get a little smidge of momentum because. As you know, in recruiting, it's it's kind of all about momentum. Mm -hmm. You start getting a couple of guys in the class, you have a good, uh, you know, visit weekend or something, and things can really change for you in a hurry. And that's basically what's happened for Mississippi State. They've gone from everybody wondering what's going on to you know who's next. Yeah. And we've seen this so many summers over the years. You know, Dan Mullen kind of started that process of oh, yeah, he sure did. Yeah, we're gonna build some momentum during the summer. We're gonna get most of our class together, and then we're just gonna try to hold them together. But I mean that that's kind of it's it's kind of his formula. Yeah. It's let's build some in-state momentum, get some guys to jump on on the boat with each other and go from there. And it's funny that it's lasted through four different coaches. Yeah. You know, the the recruiting has gone the same Mullen to Moorhead to Leach to Arnett now that and it, I think even more so this year because with Arnett and his crew being so new, you know, some guys who have not been in Mississippi the past couple of years, they needed to see these kids in person. They mm -hmm. needed to have this camp so they could see these kids up up close and personal. They they couldn't just they didn't go to games last year. You know, Chad Bumpus was in Utah last year. Yeah, he wasn't in Brookhaven. He wasn't in South Panola. He wasn't in Tupelo last year. Same with Will Friend. Same with a lot of these guys. Now they're seeing these kids in person. It tells me a lot that they're able to go from zero to sixty like this. That once they really start putting on the uh, pressure is not the right word, but when they start really amping up the recruiting process, the kids are responsive to it. That's a good sign for Mississippi State. Well, a lot of these guys are either Mississippi guys yeah. or they have ties to Mississippi. They know how to recruit Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And that resonates with a lot of these kids because they grew. a lot of these coaches grew up in the same places that some of these other guys did. Yeah, You know, Tony Hughes has been in South Mississippi, Central Mississippi, North Mississippi for 30-plus years. Yeah. 
Everybody knows him. Every coach in the state knows him. He knows these kids. He knows where they come from. David Turner is not from Mississippi, but he might as well be yeah. at this point. Uh, Chad Bumpus. Mississippi. He, and he's he's one of those. He's not too far removed from college that these kids know who he is. Yes. Too. And that, that means a lot. Mm-hmm. So this is. A friend from Mississippi, too. Exactly. This is what this is when this whole process started, and you had Zach Arnett going out and getting these coaches with Mississippi ties. Mm. This is what we all were talking about. This is going to pay off for Mississippi State, and it was kind of strange that it didn't at the beginning. But I think there's something in what you said. They had to get in here, build those relationships, and now you're starting to see the ball roll a little bit. Now, there's going to be a time where it's a down time for Mississippi State. The momentum's going to shift to Ole Miss. It's going to shift around to other teams in the SEC. That's going to happen. Mm. But State is building a solid nucleus in this class. It's very reminiscent to me, I think it could be, to that 2015 class that had all those Mississippi kids with all the ties and they kind of wanted to stick together. I think that's kind of what you're building here. And you're also adding some good pieces from Alabama too. When you, you know, when I talked to Paul Wednesday night, he said that in the next nine to ten days he expects more. Uh, and I think one of the guys everybody has an eye on right now is right here in Starkville, mm-hmm. uh, Braylon Burnside, Stonka Burnside. I know that you have covered him as a high school football player for the past few years. You know what kind of talent he is. Is he the guy, though, that once he gets in the boat, others are going to want to follow? Yeah, I think I think so. You know, he's played some AAU football with a lot of guys. He's He's got some clout. I mean, he's one of the top players in the state. Uh, four star. I think he's going to end up being if he isn't already. I hadn't looked at all the the uh, recruiting sites, but he's going to be a top five guy across the board. He's going to carry a lot of weight in the class. I think most importantly is his connection with JJ Harrell. And right now, if I had to guess, those two would probably play together. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it could be another AJ Brown, DK Metcalf situation, but hopefully it's from Mississippi State and not Ole Miss this time. Yeah, but. That's a guy that I think State's going to push. I, I don't know if he will commit this early in the process, but I feel like the the game plan is we need to get Stonk on board yeah. because, like I said, he carries a lot of weight with him, and that can start flipping your class pretty quickly in the positive direction. Right now, they've got some juice, uh, so this would this wouldn't be a bad time to do it. They they have nine commitments. I'm if I think if I'm thinking correctly. And you really, they have 10 because Traveris Banks will commit on the uh, next Sunday on the 18th. Talked to Paul about that last night. Evidently, he had just picked out that date a long time ago that it had something to do with a, a cousin who passed away and he wanted to honor him on that day. And But also at the same time, he's let the coaches know mm-hmm. we're good. It, so, it's going to be one of the worst kept secrets. Yeah. But you, I mean, the kid wants his moment. So. Yeah. So 10 commitments. If I said by kickoff on Labor Day weekend, State to like 18 commitments. Does that sound about right to you? Could be. You know, I because then you're almost done. You've only got to, you know, get about six, seven guys left. I didn't think that they'd have this many commitments. You know, two weeks ago, I didn't think they'd have this many commitments right now. Really, yeah. I thought they could get some momentum off the of top dog camp, but I think it's starting to kind of really snowball. Yeah, you know? I think it's I think it's really built. So you know, you don't know. I don't know. I, I think that at least two more are going to commit in the next two weeks. Um, so, you know, we'll see, we'll see from there what kind of transpires, but anytime you get this kind of momentum, it it seems to build and build. So it would not shock me if state was like over half full in this class by the time football season kicks off, kicks off. And they've done that before. I mean, that it's not a, it's not a formula that, that hasn't worked for state. That's been something that's been beneficial for them over the years. Yeah. All right. So this is our first stop on the Superior Catfish uh, tour that we're doing this this uh, summer. We'll go ahead. And I, it's going to be hard to top this, and I'm, yeah. the reason I'm saying that is because I want to challenge everybody else. That's a good point. <laughs> I, wanna, I, wanna I, w- I want the bar to be so set right here. They broke we'll out a new recipe do. for us today, a new menu item. I mean, you guys need to come to Little Dewey and check it out. The Catfish Reuben, catfish, sauerkraut, Thousand Island, Swiss cheese, bacon on, on the panini press. I mean, who would think of that? And I'm glad they did. That's, that's, I couldn't even finish mine. I, I took two bites, and I was like, if I eat I was already this, halfway down on my catfish uh, like, plate, and then I'm I was just like, oh, my God. I'm just going to nod off in the middle of this this interview. Yeah, yeah. Bart just kept bringing catfish. Yeah, and, the, the catfish has been great today, and it always is here at Little Dewey. Next week on the 15th, we will be in Enterprise, Mississippi, at Logan's Fish Camp. That is our Long's. next. Long's Fish Camp, my bad. 
long. Sentence. There's an edit button on there. Can... The, he's gonna, we'll make that. It never happened. And nobody heard that. <laughs> nobody, nobody heard that. Long's Fish Camp in Enterprise, Mississippi. We'll have some great guests there uh, as well. And, we'll, of course, we'll get to enjoy some more delicious superior fried catfish. Can't wait. Cannot wait. All right, guys, have a great weekend. And Robbie and I will be back with you on Monday. For Robbie Falk, I'm Brian Adat. Thanks for listening to Thunder and Lightning on Super Talk Mississippi.